Father, let's pray with me. Thank you, Jesus, for this time, this, this opportunity to share the word of the Lord here on this live platform. And God, whether it's live or recording, I pray that the word of the Lord would go forth this evening and strengthen, encourage, equip your people and bring us closer to you through this channel we call prayer. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Don't be afraid to hit that like and that uh, those hearts. That's the way we help promote a video through Facebook. Facebook's got it down pat. When you hit those likes and those hearts, that sends it viral. And when you make a comment like some of you are already doing, and you just type in amen or praise the Lord, whatever you're doing, that helps us send it viral. And the greatest thing that you can do, amen, is to share uh, a video um, like this. So let's talk here tonight. The nine most common mistakes in prayer. The nine <clears throat> most common mistakes in prayer. So I'm going to be talking to, no doubt here this evening, some seasoned prayer warriors that uh, some of this could be old hat to you. Uh, also, I'll be talking to, to maybe some brand new Christians, some brand new believers that really are, are looking to get their, to get themselves grounded in the Lord, grounded in prayer and in their faith. And so I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> these common mistakes in prayer, and all of you are going to, I believe, find um, some blessing, some information Amen. That's going to help you uh, on this evening. You know, the disciples, <clears throat> pardon me, the disciples came to Jesus in Luke 11 and verse 1. When they came to Jesus, they didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus, teach us how to prophesy. Jesus, teach us how to win souls. Jesus, teach us how to build a big church. They didn't. You find this common question. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And I've been in the church. I've had the Holy Ghost for more than 40 years, believe it or not. I was 17 years old, more than 40 years. So believe me, I've seen a lot of good, a whole lot of good, and uh, some not so good. And with all of that, I've seen a lot of people <clears throat> that for years they live for God and they did not know how to pray. They did not know how to touch God. They didn't know how to approach God. Uh, they didn't know how to address God. They didn't know how to get rid of the bad habits in prayer. They didn't even know they had bad, had bad ha habits in prayer. So that's why we're here tonight in this live teaching. Uh, Luke 18 and 1 Jesus, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus spoke a parable, beautiful parable in Luke 18. I'm not going to go through that, but I want to point out something here, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Not to faint, you know, what is that? You know, just he doesn't want us passing out, falling over on the floor. No, to in the Greek, it actually means to lose heart. It means to lack courage. And it has some other connotations. But he doesn't want us to lose heart or to lack courage, to be discouraged. He wants us to pray and to seek his face. <coughs> Pardon me. And that's what we need to do tonight. That's what we need to do every day. <clears throat> and that's why I'm having this class here, so that you'll not faint tomorrow. When you go to prayer, that you're not going to be discouraged, that you're not going to be despondent, and just give up after four or five minutes and say, I just don't know what to say to God. I don't know how to approach God. And somebody might ask the question, well, why teach on prayer? Well, these are the reasons we need to teach on prayer. Why? Because prayer is our main communication with God. Prayer is simply talking to God. And there's different forms of prayer. But if we're not talking to God, if we don't have um, a knowledge or an understanding of how to approach God and an understanding of how to touch God the way that he wants to be touched, 
You know, there, there's a, you have certain emotions, okay? Everyone has different emotions. We have the same emotions maybe, but your emotions may be slightly different than mine, the way I like to be approached, the way I like to be touched. And God is a God of emotions. The Bible talks about him being jealous, talks about him being angry, talks about uh, him being happy, talks about uh, there being joy in heaven and even in the presence of the angels. And so I believe that was Jesus. When a sinner repents, there's joy in heaven. And so we want to teach on prayer that we can grow because if we're not praying and we don't have a communication with God, we can't grow. You know, God can be absorbed. You know, you're like a sponge. I'm like a sponge. And what you give yourself to all day long, you're going to absorb that. You're going to take that in like a sponge. And if you're a person of prayer, the Bible says in one place to pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing. Does that mean we stay on our knees 24 hours a day? No, but we need to have an attitude of prayer. We need to have a sense of prayer. The Lord needs to be on our mind, a constant communication with God all the time. But with that, I, I believe that we need a time of prayer, that we need a, a, a special time, uh, a quality time, and a quantity time. Somebody says, well, we just need quantity time or quality time with God. I think it's more than a quality. I think it's quantity. You know, I could have, you know, five minutes with my wife and really have a good conversation and have just a quality time of, you know, maybe sharing dinner and conversation and just a really good time of five minutes. You think she's going to be happy with just five minutes? No, as as a loving wife and I'm a loving husband to her, I know what she wants. She wants quant quantity and not just quality. She wants me to spend time with her. She wants me to take her out. She wants to go shopping. She wants to... So guess what? I have learned to give her not just quantity time, but quality time. And I believe that God wants us to be with him. Now, you take that sponge and you put it in the water and you pull it up real fast. Guess what? You're not going to absorb too much, but you take that sponge and you put that sponge down in that water and you hold it and you keep holding it. It's going to absorb and absorb. And you're just like that sponge. The more time that you spend with Jesus, the more time you spend in his word, meditating in his word and in prayer, you're going to absorb him. Amen. You're going to, that's right. You're going to be more like him. You're going to find out what he wants out of you. Amen. So God can be absorbed. So a, a, a person with a good habit of prayer will realize a greater dimension in the spirit. He'll have more sensitivity to God. So it, it, it's that, it's that constant habit. It's that regular, what if I went, um, uh, Today being Friday, what if I, you know, I work from home. You know, my job is I've got an office here in, in my home and I'm in here all day long. But what if I got up this morning and I didn't say anything to my wife? What if I went and she made me lunch and I didn't say thank you? I didn't talk to her. I didn't kiss her during the day. Didn't give her a hug. Didn't embrace her. All day long she was there, but I didn't talk to her. Well, you know what? It wouldn't take but a half hour. She's going to say, what's wrong with you? And I believe sometimes God is saying, what's wrong with you? I've been around you all day long. I've been with you and not one time if you have expressed uh, a love and adoration and a communication. God wants someone, amen, to love him. So we're going to get into these nine points, but I want to ask you, go ahead and, and give, us, give us a like. Hit that, hit, set up some love right now. Put in a comment. Share this. Why? Because that's going to help this thing go viral. That's going to help this teaching go viral. Amen. All these movies are going viral. The world is sending every piece of debauchery out there going viral. Let's send the word of the Lord viral. If you're watching this via uh, YouTube, Give us a thumbs up, like this, and subscribe to our channel. All right, let's get into number one here, the nine most common mistakes 
in prayer. Number one, it's keeping a repentant spirit before the Lord. And I say one through nine. I'm not putting these. I don't mean any certain order that one is more important. They're all important in their own way. <clears throat> and are there more than nine? Sure, there's there's many. But these are nine pretty common mistakes. Uh, keeping a repentant spirit before the Lord. Searching our own heart. Many people are talking to God. They're asking God for things. They're making the request to God. But they're living in sin. They're living in, in some cases, willful sin. They know they're doing wrong, and they don't even bring it before the Lord. They harbor sin for weeks and months and years. We've got to confess our sins to God. Didn't he say in 2 Chronicles, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from, turn from their wicked ways. So we need to, we need to repent. We need to bring our errors, our mistakes, our sins, and we need to confess them before God. Why? We can't go to heaven harboring sin. Can anybody say amen? Can anybody type amen on that? We can't go to heaven harboring sin. We can't go to heaven thinking that we can just live a life for this world and living on the fence and, and go to heaven. But we've got to search our heart. Okay, and say, God, if you search your heart and you don't see anything, you know what? Go on, go on and pray. Seek the Lord. And if, if there's something there, be open to God that he'll reveal it to you. All right, let's go to number two. Number two, it, it, many people, when they go to prayer, and this might be for maybe more of a new believer, but a lot of folks, uh, I've seen it in church so many times, and they just don't know. But what are we here for? We're here to help. We're here to teach. But people are begging God so many times. They'll go to the altar. They'll kneel down by their bed at night. And they've got a loved one that's in ICU. They've got someone that just passed away. They've got a family problem that's total chaos. And they're in tears and they're begging God. They're frantic. They're stressed out. And they're not coming in faith, but they're coming with begging. Uh, you know, I, I don't think my parents would accept me begging them very well. I, I know that I wouldn't accept my kids begging me for anything. I'm a father. Okay. I, I, I love them. You've got to understand that God is our father and to beg him is really to insult him. I said to beg God is to insult God. We're to come and asking in faith. And yeah, we've got urgent situations. We've got family members that are sick. And man, I'm not downplaying anything that's going on. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, tonight, when we're begging God and we're, we're in this stressed prayer and faith is not being applied, God cannot answer that type of a prayer. God is looking for someone to believe him. He's looking for someone to come with faith, believing in him when they ask. Praise the Lord. Can anybody say amen? Can you type amen to that? Give me some hearts there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if you ever heard of Corey Ten Boom. She's been passed for several years, but she was a, a Holocaust victim in World War II. She was a Jewish woman. And when she was a young woman, she was taken from her home and brought into the German concentration camps. And uh, her family members died, her friends died, but Corrie Ten Boom survived. But she found Jesus. Now, I don't know if she found Jesus before the concentration camps or she became a Christian before all that happened. I don't know. But this Jewish woman became a believer in Jesus. And one of the things I remember that she spoke and that she wrote, she basically a year, for years until her health began to go down, she pretty much became an evangelist and she would be called upon to speak at churches. But one of the things that she said so stuck with me for maybe 20 or 30 years now that I heard that, but she said, prayer should be our steering wheel, not our spare tire. Amen. Prayer should be our steering wheel, 
not our spare tire. What does that mean? Well, you know, cars typically have a, a spare tire and they're not called, I, I can't, I can't even remember the last time I changed a flat tire. I literally cannot remember. I, I remember one that I changed. It was for an older woman, maybe 25 years ago. I, I don't know if that was the last one I changed or not. She wanted to give me some money in a parking lot of a grocery store. I said, no, well, I'm not taking your money. I just want to help you. I changed your tire. I don't know. Maybe that was the last time, but that wasn't my tire. But see, we cannot treat prayer like, like it's a spare tire in the trunk that we just call upon it. We just grab it when we need it. That, that's an insult to the Lord because he wants a relationship. Somebody say relationship. Somebody type in relationship. We need a relationship with God. And if you've got a relationship with God, guess what? You're going to talk to him every day. There's going to be a communication. Prayer will not be your spare tire. Prayer will be your steering wheel. It's going to take you. You're going to make those turns. The Lord is going to direct you and you're going to turn left. You're going to turn right and you're going to go straight according to the guidance of the spirit of the Lord. But it's only going to happen if you make prayer your steering wheel. <clears throat> Amen. That's powerful right there. Think about it. And that's why I remember that for so many years, prayer needs to be our steering wheel and not just something I call upon when I get in trouble. Having prayed in weeks, say a little prayer maybe at dinner, say a little prayer at church, but now I got trouble. Now I got problems. Now something serious is going, oh, I've got to pray. Well, God's asking, where have you been for the last three months? Where have you been for the last two weeks God wants to God wants a relationship. This is like a, a, a like a like like a marriage between, you know, we're in a, a spousal period. You that uh, are married or have been married and you were engaged. How long did you go without talking to that one that you were going to marry? Did you go weeks? Did you go days in your engagement period and not talk, not call, not text, not visit with? I bet you talk to them every day. Every why? Because there was a relationship was that was built there. All right. So if God is not hearing from you, how do you expect to hear from him? Amen. If God is not hearing from you, why do you expect to hear from God? How in the world am I going to hear from God if I'm not spending time with him? Number three. Let's talk about number three. Vain repetitions. Oh man, I've been guilty of that in the past. You may or may not have been guilty of it. I think most Christians at some point have been, Jesus talked about not using vain repetitions in prayer. He didn't say don't use repetition, but he said don't use vain repetition. You know, I, I asked for the same thing um, many times. That's repetition. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, there's been times and you, you know, in prayer meetings, sometimes you might hear somebody, they're saying, oh, God, stir, God, stir. Oh, God, move, move, God, move, you know. Maybe you might be, oh, God, move, God, move, God, stir, stir, God, heal, God, heal, save, God. You know, we're just praying some very vain repetition, and God is just sitting back, you know, on his throne, and we're saying, oh, God, move, God, move, and God is saying, okay, God is saying, okay, move what? You know, move what? You know, vain repetitions, just, just words that have no meanings. Well, God knows my heart. No, bring words, bring words. Tell God what you want. Tell God what you need. We don't need to come to God just you know, you could be you could be in prayer for an hour, and while you was in prayer, you could, in your mind you was changing tires, in your mind you was washing dishes, cleaning the house, in your mind you was thinking about the kids and what they were doing, you was thinking about work, in your mind you was doing all kinds of things while you were saying, "Oh God, move! Oh God, heal! Oh God, stir!" 
That's what we call vain repetitions. It means really nothing at all. We've got to have a relation. Can you imagine me having a conversation with my wife? I said, oh, Tammy, 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 get up, Tammy, make some dinner. Tammy, make some dinner. Oh, Tammy, 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 make some dinner, dinner, Tammy. Can you imagine that? She said, what is wrong with you, man? And God is sitting back sometimes and thinking, okay, you said stir, stir what? Stir the soup? God is saying, you said move, move what? Move the organ, move the piano. God wants communication. You say, well, that's silly, Brother Rodas. Yeah, I know it's silly, but we do it. Most of us have done it. <clears throat> Vain repetitions. All right, number four, not believing. We pray, we're not having faith. We don't even sometimes know the promise. We're praying for God to heal somebody. But then before we're done, we say, God, but let your will be done. In other words, God, if you want to take them, if you won't let them die, but we're praying, let God, let your will be done. We're, we're, we're saying that because we don't know the, pro we don't know the promise in the word. And we're saying many times, let your will be done because we don't know the promise. We've got to know the promise. You talk about healing. God's best is healing. God's best is healing. You've got a right to ask for healing. You've got a right to ask for deliverance because that is God's best. You don't have to say with that ending phrase of doubt, well, but let your will be done. In other words, if you don't want to do it. Did you ever see that? You know, did you ever see that? Anybody say that to Jesus in the Gospels? Well, Jesus, would you come and heal my daughter? But not my will, but yours be done. Well, Jesus, uh, Jesus, would you come and heal my servant? But, but you know, if you don't want to, that's okay. Did, did you ever hear that? No, no. That's Jesus always was willing to heal. He always responded to faith. We've got to believe what we're asking for. We need to know the promise. Why? Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible. You, you can't. There is no way to please God if you don't believe him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is what? A rewarder of them that diligently, diligently seek him. He's what? A rewarder. There's the answer right there. He's a rewarder. Why? Because you come with faith. You come with believing. Hallelujah. We come with faith. We come with believing. And, and we're, we, we have an expectation. Listen, you've got to have an expectation. You know, you're praying for me. I'm sick. Listen, don't just pray a prayer. You expect to hear good. You know, we, we, we ask for God to do something. Then we go and ex expect something bad to happen. We, 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 we pray for something good to happen, but our actions show that we really don't believe it because we're preparing for something evil, something bad, something negative to take place. We need to believe and have an expectation of what we're praying for. Can somebody say amen? Praise God. Give us some hearts there. Type in amen if you believe it. So, all right, let's go to number five. Number five of nine. And I've got a bonus after number nine. You're going to like the bonus, all right? We could say 10. But number five is we pray some, sometimes in, in, in such a way that it's so general, nonspecific, that God can't even answer the prayer. You know, I'll give you an example of a general prayer. You know, general prayers cannot be answered because general prayers do not require faith. And faith is... What moves God? Your, your prayers don't move God. You could pray all night long, honey, and if you don't believe God, I'm telling you, nothing's going to happen. But you could say one prayer. You could say, mountain, be removed. And when you believe it, that mountain is going to move. Hallelujah. It's going to move. Oh, yes, it will. So we need to have a prayer that's pinpointed. Say, oh God, uh, I need a job. God, give me a job. Lord, bless me with a job. Okay, that's pretty good prayer. But still, God would want us to be more specific. Pinpoint. All right, God's got a job for you. Um, he wants, 
got a job for you. It's going to pay good. It's going to pay six figures. A deep sea diver. Yeah, deep sea diver, a scuba diver. And you're scared to death of water. What? I can't. I'm scared of water. I'm not going to take that job. You weren't specific. God's trying to give you a job. You say, God, I need a job. God, I love working on cars. I, I, I love mechanical work. Lord, I love computers. I, I, I want to be a computer programmer. God, I love sales. I want a job in sales. I want to sell refrigerators or dryers or sell houses, sell cars, something. But when you are specific with God and you tell God what you want, amen. <clears throat> That's the kind of prayer God can answer right there. Because why? You have pinpointed your prayer. God heal. Oh, God heal. Heal, God. Oh, God heal. God is saying, okay. Heal who? Heal who? Let's tell God. Well, God knows what I want. God will just want God to heal everybody. That don't require any faith. You'll never know. That does not require faith. But when you say, God, I want you to heal John Jones of this condition in his body. Lord, heal him tonight in Jesus' name. What are you doing? You are being specific. You are pinpointing your prayer. You are pinpointing it to the to the point where it it causes you or puts pressure on you to believe because God's not going to answer without somebody believing. That's, again, general prayers are can't be answered because they don't require any faith. So I, I tell you a little story here. Bro Brother Verbal Bean years ago, he's dead and gone, but he was in a revival uh, at a certain church. <coughs> they were having prayer every morning. And one of the prayers was, a woman was given forth a, a prayer meeting, a prayer to uh, every morning. God, I want God to save my son. God save my son. Every day they prayed for whatever his name was. We'll just call him Bill. God save Bill. The church prayed for Bill. One day, Verbal Bean had days had gone by, and Verbal Brother Bean said, "Listen now, I've heard enough of this praying for Bill. God to save Bill. I've heard enough of it. Today we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to save Bill." But we're going to ask God to bring Bill to church tonight. And we're going to ask God to bring Bill to this altar. We're going to ask God to cause him to repent and to be baptized and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And they prayed that prayer. And he said, guess what? Guess who came to church that night? After all those nights of praying in just a general fashion, <clears throat> guess who came to church? Yeah, her son. Bill came to church. Guess who came to the altar that night? Yeah, repented of his sins. Guess who went and got the baptistry that night, got baptized in Jesus' name? Yeah, Bill. Guess who got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues that night? Bill. Why? Because they pinpointed their prayer. God loves that. Oh my, he loves a bold faith. He, I said he loves a bold faith. Somebody taking a hold of that faith and believing, amen, to the point that God says, yes, I want to answer that kind of prayer. That got God's attention. Let's talk about number six. Let's move on here. And we can go on and on, of course. But uh, for time's sake, number six, let's talk about distractions. Distractions in prayer is that little fox that spoils the vine. That little fox that spoils the vine. Yeah, distractions. You know, I could, you know, my morning devotions and I, I, I go in my room and I close the door and I've got my cell phone laying right over here on, on my dresser, right? And I may be walking back and forth and I'm just talking to the Lord or maybe sometimes I'm sitting on the floor and I'm just talking to the Lord and I've got my Bible in my lap and I'm glancing it sometimes and looking at scriptures and talking to the Lord. But let's say I leave my phone on there like I always do. But let's just say I leave my ringer on and ringer goes off. Got my cell phone right there ringing. Oh, who's calling me now? Who's texting me? One call after another. And I pick up the phone and I'm talking. Well, it might be important, but probably isn't. Okay. Can they wait 15 minutes, 30 minutes? Can they wait an hour? Can they wait until you get done? Is it that important that you can't have a secret time, a special time, an alone time with God that you could 
actually eliminate the distractions of the phone. You know, uh, I, I, I'm one to turn on a little gospel music. I, I'll give you this too. And maybe you do. I, I'm sure if you're a seasoned prayer warrior and you've been serving the Lord a long time, you know how important the background sounds. And if you've got kids in the house and you got animals, dogs and cats and lizards and birds and dinosaurs, who knows what you got in your house. Amen. But you know, all those distractions, those sounds, what are they doing now? What is going on? So what do I do? I turn on some good old gospel music in my room when I'm praying. And what does that do? That helps drown out other sounds. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. Well, I'm giving this to you as a, as a tip to help you focus because God, you know, you know, I take my wife out to dinner and I love to take her out to dinner. But you know, if she's t telling me something and she's talking to me or maybe we got two recliners in our living room sitting right by side by side and mine's on the right, hers on the left. And I I've learned that when she's talking to me that I need to quit looking at my tablet or my iPad. I need to quit looking at my Bible. I need to quit looking at my phone and I need to turn and I need to look at her. And she'll say to me sometime, are you listening? If, if I've not really turned yet, she say, are you listening? Why she wants my undivided attention. Isn't God even more important than that? Amen. And duly so, my wife deserves my undivided attention. But does not our God deserve our undivided attention? You think I'm going to answer the phone while I'm in prayer? Mm -mm. I don't know it's ringing. I turn the face down and I turn the ringer off. If somebody calls or, or texts, listen, I, I, I don't know what's going on in this world and what's going on with family and loved ones, but I, I feel they can wait. All right. There may be exceptions to the rule, and I'm not saying there's not, but generally speaking, they can wait until I'm done because my time with the Lord, he needs my focus, he needs my attention, and he wants it. Well, God knows my heart. He sure does know our heart. He knows our hearts better than we do. That's the scary part. He knows our hearts better than we do. I said, that's the scary part. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know what the Bible says? And, but I believe the only way we can know our hearts is by seeking the Lord with all of our hearts, pouring out our soul, pouring out our hearts to God. That's the only way that we can be right before the Lord. Amen. So all these things, there's people that could pray 30 minutes and spend 15 of that on social media. You know, all those little hindrances. Listen, the more exclusive time you give to Jesus, the more focused time you look him in the eye and you turn toward him sitting in that recliner, so to speak. You turn toward him, you look at him in the eye, you set everything down, amen, and you eliminate the distractions. I don't care if it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever your prayer time is, if it's an hour, get rid of the distractions. Get your mind on him. This is how God can speak to you. God will never speak to you when you're distracted like that. God can't speak to you. God don't do much... Uh, in a lot of noise. He don't do a lot in a lot of confuse, confusion, but he will speak to you in a still small voice and you have to listen. You have to be in a position to listen. All right, let's go to number seven. We've got nine and then like I said, we've got the bonus. So don't go anywhere. You're going to like this. Number seven, sometimes in prayer, we lack a persistence. And we just throw out a prayer. We come to God. You know, we've got this, you know, we've got this grocery list. You know, we've got everything that we wrote out in a sense. And, you know, we all these prayer requests. And God save uh, Jim, save, save Sherry, save Sue, save June, save Lucretia, save Josh, save this one. He'll touch the pastor, touch the church family. That's all well and good. That's all good. Nothing wrong with that. But it's more than that is my point. It's more than giving God our grocery list. What if I just told, sat down with my wife and I just gave her 
okay, today I need you to do the dishes. Today I need you to clean the house. I need you to take care of the kids. I'm going to be working all day, but I need you to do all these things. She's going to look at me sideways, you know. She's going to look at me sideways. That's not a relationship. That's not a relationship. God wants more than just a to-do list. But God wants a relationship. Hey, did anybody get what I'm saying here? Give me an amen here. Give me some hearts there. If this is making sense to you, let me know. I can see those hearts there. I can see your amens here on Facebook Live. If, if this is making sense to you, uh, give me some love there on that. Let, give me some amens. Praise the Lord. So a lack of persistence uh, and, and also with that, a consistency, a daily practice of prayer. You know, like I said, people, some people pray only when they get in trouble. You know, something bad happens to one of the grandkids. Uh, somebody's deathly ill or whatever, you know. I, and, 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 and that's that's their, that's their means of prayer. But let me tell you, we need to pray in the good times, not just the bad times. We need to pray when everything's going smooth, when everything's going good. We need to bring our petitions. We need to bring our love and our adoration, our thanks, our praise to God. And listen, don't don't just... Prayer was not made just for the bad times. Prayer, again, is a relationship with God. And I'll tell you what, I got a relationship when I got saved. Yeah, okay. A lot of people got a relationship when they got married, too. Mm -hmm. And they never turned to look at their wives. And their wives never turned to look at them to talk. And they really don't have a relationship. Praise the Lord. You know what I'm talking about. I I'm, I'm getting down to the nitty gritty here. You know the, that's the nuts and the bolts of this right here. That's relationship. It's a friendship. I want to be a friend of God. I don't want to just be a, a servant of the Lord. I want I, when God When I speak, I want God to hear me. When I talk, I want God to take notice. Why? So when I'm co constantly loving on God, constantly giving him communication and appreciating him in the good times, I have no question that when the bad times come that God's going to hear me. I don't have to get frantic. I don't have to fall apart. I don't have to go into some tearful, chaotic prayer. Why? Because I've been consistent with God every day. I've made prayer my daily practice. How about you? Is, is prayer your daily practice or are you going to make it your daily practice? Maybe it hasn't been, but you're seeing right now that this should be your daily practice. Listen, if nothing else, make it 10 minutes a day. And, 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 and watch, this is important here, what, what I'm going to give you. Here, eight and nine, very important. Now, eight, number eight is probably going to only help brand new Christians, brand new believers. You've been serving the Lord for years. Number eight is probably not even, uh, it's old hat to you. You you know the answer. But let me cover number eight because if there's brand new Christians on here or people that just haven't been serving God long and you just don't know, I want to give you this because I want to help you. Okay, I care. That's why I'm on here. You know, I'm not getting paid to do this. I care about you. Uh, and I may not even know you. But I care because I want to help you get closer to Jesus. So number eight is, I've heard it asked, uh, on, on, have listened to Christian radio in the past, and, I, and I've heard the question, call in, you know, somebody will call in, you know, the preacher, the Bible answer man, or somebody be on there, and somebody will call in and ask, ask a question, you know, the Bible answer man, he's got every answer there is supposedly in the world, and the and person on the other line, this honest, new, brand new Christian believer asked the question, say, well, I want to ask you about prayer, and, and I'm not really sure who I should pray to, and I'm not sure if I should pray to the Father, if I should pray to the Son, or I should pray to the Holy Spirit, and I heard one lady addressing the, 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 the Bible person, uh, the man that was doing the program, and she was a asking this question. She said, you know, if I pray to Jesus, I don't want the Holy Spirit to get jealous. I, I, you know, and that might sound a little comical to some of us that have been serving God for a long time, but really for an honest-hearted person that just does not know. Listen, I want to share with you right now. Listen, if, if, if you've struggled with that thought, if you'll share this, listen, I hope we get at least 50 shares 
Please share this right now. Share this. Why? Because if you don't know that answer, let me give you the answer. It's very simple, very simple. When you address Jesus in prayer, you're addressing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You don't have to pray to the Father and pray a separate prayer. You don't have to worry about making one jealous. Okay, and I know for some of us that's very elementary, but I've heard that question more than once. So I wanted to address that here on number eight. Let me give you number nine. I, I think number nine is pretty important. I think it's more important than, than most would understand. And that is having a familiar place to pray every day, praying in the same place. And I'm talking about having a, a, a special time of prayer uh, and a special place of prayer, if at all possible. You know, uh, now let me give you um, uh, what I would say would be a hindrance to your praying for most people. Could be exceptions to the rule. I know it'd be a hindrance for me. If, you know, Monday I pray in my bedroom at, you know, 8 a.m. And Tuesday I pray in my living room at 10 p.m. Wednesday I go to the garage and I pray in, in the afternoon. Thursday I skip prayer and Friday, I pray in the morning again. I'm back in the living room. You know, and I've got an inconsistent time. I've got an inconsistent place of prayer. You need a consistent place of prayer. You need a consistent time of prayer, if at all possible. I know work schedules can change those things. I know family situations, can, emergencies can change those. I understand all that. Generally speaking, why? Because I know that I have become accustomed to my bedroom. That is where I pray most mornings, every morning. That is where I do most of my praying. And I, it's common to me. What I see, I might be walking. Sometimes I'll be walking in prayer, walking back and forth, just talking to the Lord, worshiping God, you know, making my request, etc., etc. And, you know, maybe there's a little little cobweb over there in the corner. I've seen that little cobweb. I'm not saying there is, but you know what I mean. Uh, maybe there was something messed up over there, you know, not just right. Maybe the pillow's hanging out on the bed. Something's just, you know what? It's common. I, I see it. it it's, it's common to me, and it doesn't get my attention. Now, I pray in the living room, or I could be praying in the bedroom. Now I'm looking, oh, look at that. that. I missed a spot there when I painted that last year. Boy, oh boy, I didn't see that spot. You know, now I got that on my mind. All right. No, then I stepped on one of the kids' little army men. You know, my, my foot's hurting. You know, uh, and, and, and I don't have this common place. I don't have a common time. I'm inconsistent. Consistency is so vital in prayer. Everything about prayer that you can be consistent. You say, well, I'm one of those. I can pray anytime, any, anywhere. I am too. But I'm talking about making it the best. I'm talking about making it the most focused I can make it with God. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Making it the best and the most focused and pinpointed where I can completely give God my attention. That's why I'm talking about being consistent every day in the place I pray and in the time I pray. You may not be one of those that can pray in the mornings. Maybe yours is in the afternoon or the evening. Maybe you're praying at 3 a.m. on a regular basis. I don't know. But whatever it is, <clears throat> whatever it is, you know, be consistent in that. Amen. Let me read you a scripture here. That uh, that was number nine, and I've got a bonus. I want to give you that bonus, but let me read you this scripture in Matthew 7 and 7. Some of you can quote this powerful verse, actually two verses, Matthew chapter 7. Give me some hearts there. Give me some likes. Please share this. If you haven't shared it, we want this to go viral. We want Facebook, all of the world to see this video. Why? Because millions of people do not know how to pray. You may be an awesome prayer warrior, but let's not take it for granted that those around you uh, know how to pray. All right. So help me out with that. There's only so much I can share it. Matthew 7, 7. And I'm also going to read verse 11. Verse 7, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Now we're talking about persistence here. We're talking about a level of seeking God. We ask. Okay. And then we 
we stay consistent and we begin to not just ask, we begin to seek out the answer. Okay, we do more than seek. We finally find where we're going. And what do we do? We asked, we, we sought it out, and then we got there and we're knocking on the door. We're knocking on God's door. We're ready to receive an answer. Verse 11, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father or your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him. Now, right after this, I've got the bonus I'm going to give you, and then we're going to pray, and then we'll be done. But let's go over the verse 11 real good. If ye then being evil, you and I have a tendency of being evil. You and I have a sinful nature. God does not have a sinful nature. Of course, we have received the Holy Ghost. We have received a divine nature. We crucify the flesh. We mortify the flesh. We keep under our body. We bring it under subjection. And we walk and we live in the spirit. We do not live for sin. But we have the potential. We have the nature of sin, even with the divine nature. We have two natures, the sinful nature and the divine nature inside of us. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, don't you know how to give good gifts unto your children? You make them breakfast and lunch and dinner. You take them out. Sometimes I'll go into uh, Menard's. And I'll pick up something maybe on the way home or just go over there for something one night. And, 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 I'll, and I'll go over to this little deal they've got there, this little box and this big box sitting up. And they've got all these little toy cars. And they're about $3 each. Cars and little trucks and little motorcycles. You can imagine. It's all there. They're like $3 each. What do I do? i got two little guys in my house here, three years old and six years old. And what do I do? I pick them up one. Okay, when I and they know I'm coming home from Menards, guess what? I came home from Menards the other night, and uh, little Eli looked at me, and just smiling, waiting for me to say, I got you something. I didn't say anything. I did get him something, but I tricked him. That night, I didn't. I got him a little flashlights for like $3. I got him a little, because I know little boys love flashlights. So I got them little flashlights, and so they can run around the house shining their flashlight, okay, and having fun. So we know how to give good gifts unto, uh, unto our children. But how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? If, 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 if we want to give good things, what about God? What about God? Don't you know that God wants to answer your prayers? That's why I'm doing this little study tonight, because I want to help you pinpoint your prayers, bring your prayers into focus and get more answers from God because when you're distracted your faith is distracted so God gives good things to them that ask him why because we are sons and daughters of God we are his children we're not mere servants we're not beggars on the road begging for something we're not to beg for anything because we are the children of of God. Hallelujah. So focus on those verses. Give me some more hearts there. Share this. Make a comment right now. Help it go viral in Jesus' name. Let me give you the bonus. We're almost done. The bonus could be number 10. We could call it number 10. Make your prayer time versatile. Make your prayer time versatile. What I mean by that is don't just, again, give God your grocery list. You know, we give God a request. That's all well and good. We need to do that. The Bible says to do that. But I can prove to you, I'm not going to take the time today, but I can show you in several Bible passages where we are to bring God, when we come into his presence, we are to bring him praise and worship. When, when I start my prayer out in the morning, I don't, okay, God, here I am. All right, I need this, okay, I need this. I don't do that. I never do that. You know what I do? Because I know what the Bible teaches, and I'm encouraging you. If you didn't know, this is what you need to do. And this is how you're going to make your prayer life more exciting. Prayer is too boring, okay? If you don't know what you're doing, okay, and you haven't had good teaching on prayer, prayer becomes boring, and then you don't want to do it. <clears throat> so you begin your time of prayer with praise because praise and worship is a a form of prayer all right so uh, i close the door i turn off the light I, I like i send my dark room got my gospel music on and what do i do and i'm walking back and forth and i'll just say hallelujah i thank you jesus i worship you today lord jesus i magnify your name 
Lord, I just give you glory. I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Oh, I just praise you for all that you've done for me. And what am I doing? I'm just thanking the Lord. I'm getting his attention with some praise. I'm getting his attention with some love. Come on now. God wants to be loved. God wants to be adored. He's not some robot sitting up there, some computer that's programmed. God is a God of affection. And he wants his people to come with praise and enter his courts with praise and his gates with thanksgiving. And so when you enter that prayer time, don't come with your grocery list. Lay that aside. Just there's been, there's been times, maybe a solid hour or more, I didn't ask for anything. All I did was praise him thank him. Why? I said, God, I've got needs, but I'm not even going to ask you for anything today. I know that you know because I've been asking you every day, but today I'm not going to ask you for anything. All I'm going to do is just worship you. I'm going to praise you. I feel the Lord just right now telling you about it. Man, this is powerful, bros. Sister, this is powerful. When, when, when you take advantage of this key in prayer and you take your prayer time to a new level with God. And now you enter your time with praise. You don't have to get on your knees. You might stand. You might sit. You might sit on the bed. You might sit in a chair. You might just stand with your arms up in the air and worship and thank the Lord. Thank him for his goodness. You could do that for five minutes. You could do that for 30 minutes. How much do you have to thank God for? You woke up today with the right mind. You woke up today. You just woke up today. How, how much more? You woke up. You, 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 you got food in the fridge. You've got food in the cupboard. Listen, you've got, you've got a, a gas in the car. Listen, look at all that you can thank God for your family and your church. You've got a lot, and, and we need to be doing that. Again, it's not just that. But with that, we also need to learn to pray in the Spirit. <clears throat> I'm almost done. But we need to learn to pray in the Spirit. If you have the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues, you can pray in the Spirit every day. You can yield yourself to the Spirit. I run out of things to pray for. I, I might pray for somebody, and I might pray for something, and I, I'm rewording it, you know, 5, 10, 20 different ways. I'm telling God every kind of a way I can that he needs to do this. I'm doing everything I need to convince God. But the Bible says, I believe it's in Romans chapter 8, that, that, the, <coughs> pardon me, that the Spirit prays for what we don't know. Okay, it's praying through us. And when you're praying in tongues and you're praying in the spirit, you are going into a dimension of prayer beyond what the human mind even knows or understands. You're going into a new dimension. All right. And so I want to encourage you, give your praise, give your worship, make your requests known unto the Lord. All right. And pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. Try to do that every day. Speak with tongues, yield to the Holy Ghost every day, but start out in praise and worship because when you start out in praise and worship, that right there will take you into a dimension that you'll probably won't get into any other way. If you just bring your grocery list, you're not going to go into that dimension. Very unlikely. You might, but usually not. When you start out with praise and worship and you get his attention, you got his attention. Oh, honey, when somebody starts bragging on me, I'm like, who said that? Oh, yeah, who said that? Let me, we start bragging on Jesus. Don't you think he's not looking? Hey, Gabriel, hey, uh, Michael, you, you see what he said? Uh, you see what Katie Ramirez just said? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you see what Lucretia just said? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're praising me right now, see? They're worshiping me. That gets God's attention. That's powerful right there. So I want to encourage you. And, and have your Bible nearby. Now, I, I'm fortunate. I've got an, uh, an iPad. You might have an iPad or a tablet. Maybe your Bible's on your phone. What I really like about these devices is I used to have my Bible, but I could hardly read it in the dark. You know, I like a semi-dark room when I'm praying. And so, but I, I can turn my tablet on, and I've got my Bible right there, and it's lit up. And so now I can, I can, I can just kind of scan over the Scriptures, scan through Psalms a little bit, and... and, and, and Maybe pray some scriptures. Pray the Psalms. Have you ever prayed the Psalms? Pray the Psalms. If you get hung up and you want to keep, you want that relationship, you want to pray longer, pray the Psalms. I've done it and I prayed it like it was my prayer. <clears throat> I focalized it like it was me giving it the first time to God. I've done that so many times and, 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 and so many times with that, my spirit would break and I would go into weeping and to strong praying and crying and my heart would just 
just pour out to the Lord. Amen. I'm talking about touching God tonight. Amen. So we're pretty much done, uh, uh, my brothers and sisters, but I want to pray for you. And um, I thank you for being on here. Share this. If you've not shared it, please share this right now. Give us some more likes here real quick. Give us an amen. I'm going to pray for you. And uh, we're going to end this session until, Lord willing, next Friday we'll be back on same same time. Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're so thankful. We thank you for this time, this opportunity. We thank you for what you've done. God, what you've done, what you're going to do, what you're doing right now. We thank you for all the people that have tuned in with us today. God, some of, us, some of them have stayed the whole entire teaching. Some could not stay the entire teaching. But God, I pray whatever they've got, they got five minutes out of today. I pray, Lord, that was a blessing to them. And Lord, as this is shared throughout social media, Facebook, and who knows other platforms and YouTube. I pray, God, that this will be a blessing to the church worldwide, not because of me, but because of the precious word of God. We thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you. I'm going to be praying for you. You pray for me. We'll see you soon.